All right. Happy Friday, fellow wine lovers. Stephanie Miskew here, certified sommelier and author of, of The Glamorous Gourmet, coming to you live on this fabulous Friday, September 29th. Uh, and it is great to be back with you with my wine picks of the week. I hope you've all had a great week and I'm thrilled you could join me today. I have some a good topic in store and before we really got started, I just wanted to clear something up because today we're talking about hurricane wines, right? And I've put that out there a few days ago and I just didn't want anyone to think I was taking the topic too lightly. Believe me, I've grown up in Florida, been through some horrible storms and my heart goes out to the people in Puerto Rico. It, it's horrible what they're going through and I just didn't want anyone to think I was making light of the situation because I would never do that. And I mean, let's face it, we are here in Florida and, and everywhere. We're at the height of hurricane season right now. And you know, in light of our recent um, experience with Hurricane Irma, and you know, it's a tense time. So we have two long months and some of our worst storms have come in October. So for me, I don't know about for you, but for me, nothing takes the edge off of hurricane anxiety like humor and wine. So, you know, I thought maybe we could just have a little bit of fun with it. And also for practical reasons, if you're a wine collector, I don't care if you have 500 bottles or 10, there's things you have to know about protecting your investments during a storm. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to talk about that too. So I just didn't want anyone to think I was making light of the situation because I would never do that. And believe me, I can't wait to toast the people of Puerto Rico when they're back up and running. And it's going to be a while. I mean, we know that. And thanks for the thumbs up. I appreciate it because I would never make light of a situation like that. So in any event, we're going to have a little bit of fun and just talk about some practical and fun things today. And I am so happy you could join me. I really am. It's happy hour, officially happy hour on Friday. And let's see, Jen, Jen says, happy Friday. It's raining here. So I'm hoping we will not lose power internet. Us too. And I actually had two dropped connections before I started this one, but I will keep, even if we get disconnected, I will keep trying to join you. So stay tuned. When you see the little thing pop up that I'm live, just click on that. But hopefully we'll be fine. You know, you never know. And so again, thank you so much for joining me. And I'm glad we got that cleared up. And Nancy says, happy hour. It, amen. Why limit happy hour to one hour? Yeah, for me, it's just like the kickoff to the many hours we're going to have over this weekend of you know, just enjoying ourselves and relaxing. And I can't believe this is my 10th episode already. It's, gosh, I, it seems like just a few months ago, I was so petrified of doing Facebook Live. And, you know, it's still a little scary, but you all have made it such a great experience. And I so appreciate that. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for your comments. And it's just, it's awesome. It makes it so much, so much more fun and so much easier. So, hey there, Laura. She says, hello, happy, happy. Cheers to that. So, yeah, we're going to have some fun today. Hey, Tom, so glad you could join us today. And while we're getting settled, let me just make sure I can pull up my video here. Hold on. It takes a few minutes for it to come up on my end. And there we go. Awesome. Yay everybody's coming in. Well, good guys. I, I'm again, I'm thrilled you can join me and you know, what better way to kick off the weekend? Maybe you might get inspired and on your way home, you can swing by the wine store and pick up some great wine. So, but today I am going to be sharing as always four wines. Each kind of fits into hurricane prep a little differently. So, and we'll find that out in a minute. So let me see. So a little bit about the format for those of you who might be joining us for the first time. Uh, basically, each Facebook Live, I talk about four wines. I introduce them. I taste my way through them. But during that time, at any time, you can comment or ask questions. And I can, that's the beauty of this. I can answer them or comment back in real time. So, you know, it's like my favorite way to enjoy wine is with friends and talking about it. So please feel free to leave a comment or question at any time. I love when y'all do that. 
Um, normally, I try to keep these to about 30, 30, 40 minutes, but you know, we'll see. I'm happy to be here as long as you need me. So, but that's just a ballpark figure again if you're joining us for the first time. Also, if you're watching this broadcast after the live broadcast, which happens, you know, everybody can't tune in right now, although I wish you could. But if you're watching this after the live broadcast, please go ahead and comment and ask questions as if you were watching it live, because I monitor these for weeks afterwards and I will definitely get back to you with uh, either respond to your question or comment. And so please, by all means, go ahead and do that. And also on the right hand somewhere, it should say, click this button to be notified when I go live. And if you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it. So anyway, it just makes it easier for you if you want to tune in and join us on Fridays, which I hope you do. So anyway, just a little housekeeping stuff. And let's see who else is here. If you're here, throw up some emojis or, or leave me a comment and tell me where you're watching from. I'd love to know. Oh, and Nancy says you are wearing UVA colors too. Go who's. Yes, I did that on purpose. No, I am pretty much sports illiterate, except for hockey. So I'm glad it worked out that way, though. So awesome. And let's see. Great. So it looks like people are filtering in. So a little bit about our theme. And I mean, let's face it. Prepping for a hurricane is so <laughs> nerve-wracking. Because unlike other natural disasters where we have tornadoes or earthquakes, we get, we get notice, which is great. Hey, Terry, cheers to you. Glad you could join us. Uh, and while it's great to get notice that something's coming, the only downside to that, as with Ir Irma that just happened, is that it go it can go on for days if they miscalculate how long that thing's going to take to get here. I mean, I think we had a whole week of preparations for Irma, during which time you're kind of like, you're very nervous and anxious and you're compulsively going to the grocery store or Home Depot because you feel like there's got to be something I forgot. And whether it's a generator or plywood and then you're at the grocery store duking it out over some milk or something. And it's just, you know, it's in the air. Everyone is, is tense. And it's just, you know, it can be very nerve wracking having that time. So, um... Anyway, also, it, but nothing takes the edge off this anxiety. Again, like I said, like humor and mostly wine. So again, I'm going to go over some wines that are really going to help you in your preparations and also things you can do to protect your wine um, in the event that you do lose power. Like we lost power for six days during Irma, but it's been longer than that. Anyway, so we'll go into that in a little while. So, um, and my question before we get started is... Oh, wait, you know what? That's from last time. Never mind. My question to you is, can you hear me? Before we jump into our tasting, if you can give me a thumbs up or say, yes, I can hear you, that would be great. And then we will just start moving right along, I think. Terry says, when people were buying water, I was buying wine. My kind of gal, Terry. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> exactly. I had so much stocked up and, you know, and that was a big concern of ours. Thank you. Good. All right. I'm taking it that you can hear me and we're just going to move right along. But first I got to love your comment because that's awesome. Yeah. And it's a big consideration because I have wine, not only that I sell, but also our own little collection and it was a little stressful. So our first wine, and for those of you just joining us for the first time, when I taste through each wine, I use the six S's of tasting, which are see, swirl, sniff, sip, and swish, and then savor finally. And normally professionally, I would I would spit the wine out, but because it's Friday, I choose to savor. So I'm going to jump into our first wine. And for the, the first wine is for those that time when you're prepping for the hurricane. Like you've got that underlying generalized anxiety and you're kind of like, what's going on and how bad is this going to be? So this is a good time for like a light white wine, something you can kind of drink on a continuous basis. It's not very expensive and it's not too high in alcohol because you still got to run around and do your prep. But, you know, it's just enough that it's something you can sip on and it's something to kind of calm the nerves a little bit, but it's nothing that's like too, too strong or that's going to kind of put you out of commission. So I think either a Pinot Grigio or Sauvignon Blanc is good for this. And the wine that I've picked today is the Matua Sauvignon Blanc 
from Marlboro, New Zealand. And let me just flip the screen so I can show you the label. And you can see this beautiful label. And But the interesting thing, and it's again, the Matua Sauv Blanc from Marlboro, New Zealand. They were actually the first winery to make a Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand back in 1974. They were definitely ahead of their time. But what was really cool is when I first got this bottle and I unpacked it, and it was a sample, so props to the folks at Matua. This, see this snowflake over here, or this beautiful decoration? That was not there on the label when I took it out of the box. These folks have done something very ingenious and very cool, which is they've put a thermographic label on their bottle. So this beautiful part shows up when the wine is chilled enough to drink and they've done this with their white wines and their rosés and they're each calibrated a little differently so when this wine reaches 45 degrees this beautiful part of it shows up again it wasn't there i wish i had another bottle i could show you the before and after but i pulled it out of the fridge i'm like what is that and then i read the the information I'm like how cool so i would never seen anyone doing that before which is kind of neat. So, but again, Sauv Blanc is a great choice for before the storm. And let's go ahead and taste through. How many of you out there are already um, fans of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc? It's obviously known for, this is pretty much the signature white wine of New Zealand. But if you're a fan, either let me know what, which, which producer you like specifically, or you can just throw up a hands up. But um, let's see, oh, Monica says, I look and sound fantastic. I bet you do too, lady. Good to see you. So glad you could join us. But anyway, I think my friend Oscar out there might be a bit of a Sauvignon Blanc fan, and we're going to get to that fun in a minute. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and dive into the tasting of the wine. It's 100% Sauvignon Blanc, which is the grape variety. Oh, okay, I'm back. I think it came back. Fermented entirely in stainless steel, which means that the wine is crisp, fresh, and fruity. There's no oak on it, so it doesn't have any spice notes. It just has beautiful, fresh fruit. So first S is C. So I'm going to look at the wine first. It's always good to do it over a background, and I'll show you guys right here. It's a beautiful, pale, pale lemon yellow color. There's no browning, nothing floating in it. Um, if it were browning around the edges, we might think that it got oxidized or exposed to heat or that it was an old wine, and it's not. It's a 2016 vintage, $13 a bottle. Awesome deal. So this looks just like I would expect a 2016 uh, brand new Sauvignon Blanc to look like. So next, I'm going to roll into our next two S's, which are Swirl and Sniff. And the best way to sniff is just, again, swirl to really crank up the volume on the aromas of the wine and then just stick your your nose in the glass as far as you can go. If it touches the wine, you've gone too far. You need to back up a little bit. But And uh, if Oscar's listening, I don't know if you're there, but can you guess what I might be getting on the nose of this wine? In fact, one of the primary aromas is cat pee. Yep, you heard me, folks. Cat pee and Sauvignon Blanc. Are like this it's very often a, in a tasting note of Sauvignon Blanc or the aroma section you'll hear the term cat pee and it really does but strangely not in a bad way so I get like cat pee and freshly cut grass and citrus it's very bright like I can smell the minerality and the acidity before I even taste it but you know what based on the aromas I'm gonna go ahead and taste it so now I roll into our next two S's which are sip and swish and I added swish on there a few months ago because unless you're really swishing the wine around your mouth and having it hit every flavor receptor you're not really gonna get the best idea of what that wine is about. So that's why I say not only sip, but it's important to swish. And right off the bat, wow, beautiful notes of lemon curd and and that fresh cut grass that kind of, that New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is known for and that just acidity that lights up your tongue. This immediately I'm craving lo um, oysters, lobster, anything you would squeeze a lemon on would go brilliantly with this wine. But again, let me see if I left any. Yeah, definitely. It, it also tastes like, you know those candies we used to eat when we were kids? 
or more recently called lemon heads it, it has that kind of really lemony flavor but without the sweetness it's not sweet but it is fruity and lots of white peach as well and it also has kind of a, a salinity to it that makes me kind of think more of the shellfish thing but it, it's a very nice wine Marl Marlboro you like wines from Marlboro Tom awesome fabulous so yeah if you are a Sauv Blanc fan or if if you're a white wine fan let me know what kind of grape you like the best if it's not Sauv Blanc are you a Pinot Grigio fan or a Chardonnay fan and you ponder that while I take another sip <laughs> yeah that is textbook Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand it's really really refreshing great for summer really great for summer um, so but in Florida it's summer most of the time so we can drink this probably much 80 80 percent of the year and be totally fine with it so let me see I want to make sure I didn't leave anything out so yes perfect wine light whites like Sauvignon Blanc like this wine perfect for the pre hurricane prep time when you need a little something to take the edge off but you can't drink anything too strong so love this wine it's it's a really nice choice any questions about this wine or anything so far let's see can you guys still hear me it got a little quiet if you can still hear me throw up a little heart or a little thumbs up seems kind of quiet over there just so I know you can hear me I don't want to go on and on if if nobody's there so if you could just leave a little thumbs up this is hmm a little suspicious are you there all right I'm gonna keep going but if you hear this and you want to send up or leave me a comment or again a little thumbs up or something I would appreciate it so our next wine our second wine of the tasting this is for the stage of the storm where you've just lost power you were hoping it wouldn't happen you were hoping you could dodge the bullet like we did with Hurricane Matthew it looked really bad for us but then it literally at the last minute it it took a step a little further east and it skipped right over us but in the event like with Irma if you lose power unless you have a generator bad things are gonna happen in your refrigerator and I know this firsthand because during Hurricane Wilma this is before everyone had generators and all that jazz I think Wilma was really the big uh, impetus for everyone to run out and get a generator but nobody had them at that point and we were without power for 16 days so there's few words that can describe what happens in your fridge when you lose power for two weeks oh hey Jill good to see you Jill says I love Albarino and Sancerre thumbs up love them both great choice um, but anyway there yeah there's bad things that happen in your fridge after losing power for for two weeks over two weeks and the thing is if there's any wine in that fridge even if it's unopened wine the cork is very porous so if there's any like not so great aromas going on in there it can it can seep into the wine and I've had that happen before actually during Hurricane Wilma so these are the types of wines that you want to drink there's stuff in your fridge now you need to start drinking it if you've lost power and strangely enough during the last hurricane and we have a generator but I guess our wine collection had grown a little bit <laughs> since the last hurricane because it came down to the fact our generator couldn't power our wine fridges and our food fridge so we actually had to make the decision to ditch the food fridge so we could preserve our wine fridges so yeah I mean priorities right it's all about priorities so being wine lovers that's just what we had to do so we got busy drinking the stuff we had stocked up on we had some bottles in there from early on in the summer and this and I've been stressing this for a while this is the perfect time to drink any rosé you have left over for the summer so and that is my example for this wine our second wine is the Mas de Brazad hold on let me flip the screen Mas de Brazad uh, rosé from Costier de Nîmes it's from the Rhone Valley in France 
Oh, I thought I had a handle. That label's a little difficult. But again, it's a beautiful rosé. This is actually the 2013 vintage, so it's been in there for a little while. But you can see the wine is still a beautiful pink color. It's a darker rosé. It's funny because it's just next door to Provence, but it's very different. Provencal rosés are normally very light in color. This one's a little darker, but what that means is there's more tannins in the wine, might be able to preserve it a little longer. I'm sorry you can't see that label better. But anyway, this is the type of wine we were drinking and we thought, you know what, 2013, is it gonna be okay? It's drinking very nicely, which I'm happy to report. And this wine, let's see, retailed for about, uh, I think like $15 a bottle. Hold on, let me put this over here. So I'm not confused. Uh, but it, again, we were drinking this after Hurricane Irma. And it was drinking very nicely, which I'm happy to report. So <clears throat> let's have a look at the color. You can see this one, it's pretty dark pink. And there's not a lot of oranging going on or browning to this wine. Some rosés after this many years, they might turn a little brown, brownish. But this one has maintained its color pretty nicely, I gotta say. A little bit of orangey, but not, not too much. Not as much as I would expect from most rosés um, being that old, but in any event. So the color looks great. So I'm gonna roll into our next S's, which are Swirl and Sniff. And as any wines age, this is just characteristic of wine as it ages, it, wines lose fruit and they gain more complexity or what we call tertiary aromas and flavors, which are basically aromas and flavors that can only be produced by age, by aging wine. So I'm getting less fruit on this wine and I'm getting more notes of kind of an earthy, spicy thing going on. There is a little bit of um, pomegranate and uh, and cranberry, but it's got this really interesting personality that, that I kind of like, and surprisingly enough, because I've been preaching that, drink your rosé, it doesn't get any better, but it might get more interesting. So, all right, I'm gonna roll right into tasting it, or sip and swish. Yeah, and it's, this is really like a red wine drinker's rosé. It tastes a lot like it's got some nice tannin going on to it. That's really appealing. It's very nice, and again, it has like the earthy, it has notes of like blood orange, um, and, and kind of like a strawberry balsamic thing going on. So it's it's really, really tasty, I gotta say. I was very pleasantly surprised. Has nice tannins, nice acidity still. It lights up your mouth. Like I would love something like a like a seared duck breast or a duck salad or something like that, because it has some nice body as well. But again, this is the Masse Prasad Rosé from France's Rhone Valley. And I'll link up um, on my on a blog post on my blog um, all the details about this wine too. I haven't been doing that as much, but I'm getting better, getting more consistent at doing that. But definitely a nice and, a, and an interesting wine. And you might find, and I, in fact, did any of you kind of, any of you who experienced power loss during the Hurricane Irma, did you taste some wines that you might have had in the back of your fridge that you thought you might drink? If so, let me know. I'd love to hear about it and hear what you thought. You know, were they still good or were they not so good? Stuff happens. Ooh, Tom says, Sancera Muscadet. Fabulous. I like the way you guys drink. This is good. I got a fun group going on. So thank, thanks again for tuning in. And let's see if I forgot. Yeah, or this would go great with even like a salmon. Very nice. Like the mouthfeel is similar. It has kind of that, a bigger mouthfeel than a lot of rosés do. But a lovely wine nonetheless. Let me take another sip. So any questions about any of our wines so far? If so, go right ahead and leave them in the comment section. We're all friends. So I'd be happy to answer anything. Again, if you're watching this after the live broadcast, go ahead and ask, throw a question or a comment up as well. Keeps things interesting. Okay, so we've covered the, the prep for the storm. We've covered when your power goes out. You gotta drink those wines in the fridge, kind of get them. You don't want them to be exposed to what happens in the fridge after you don't have power for two weeks or longer. So this third phase is this is what you should do when you've got no power for days. And in case you don't have a generator, 
and in which case you do. And this is kind of my spiel where if you have 10, 10 bottles of wine or 500 bottles of wine, you need to have a plan when it comes to hurricane season because and it's funny because wine has been all over the news recently. I don't know if you've seen it, that wine is now the most, the best performing collectible of any, of anything, cars, any other kind of wealthy, high ticket collectible item. Wine right now is the best performing one. And they should have put an asterisk because that can all get wiped out in one storm. If that wine isn't uh, stored correctly or it goes for too long a time without the proper conditions, you can kiss your whole collection goodbye. And unfortunately, a few years ago, I was evaluating someone's cellar and it was here, it was their summer house, and they, but they still kept a, a sizable amount of wine here. And I walk in and the first thing I saw was that every bottle in the racks was leaking from the capsule and some of the corks had started to push out. Now, whenever you see that, so it's pretty obvious when a wine has been exposed, not only in the color, but in the bottle, you'll find that like wine is dripping, there's stickiness around the capsule, or that if it's really bad, the corks have been pushed out, and literally every nice bottle the guy had was had been exposed to really high temperatures for a long period of time. And it's sad, and in some cases you can still drink the wine. Essentially what it does is it fast forwards the aging process. So a beautiful Napa Cab or Bordeaux that you were planning on holding on to for 20 years, or wines you set aside, you bought them in your kid's birth year, you gotta drink them sooner than you were planning on, right away, the sooner the better, if they're even still drinkable. Sometimes they can just oxidize. So you really need to put a system in plan, whether whole house generator is the best way, or a lot of storage facilities um, locally specialize in wine storage. They guarantee they'll never lose power. And now you know how to check that. So if you ever notice any of your bottles are leaking around the cork, or again, the corks are pushing out, that's in like really bad situation. Then those wines have been exposed to heat for too long, and unfortunately it can ruin the wine. So definitely something you want to think about in the event, you know, that we're at the height of hurricane season here. Just something to think about. And um, so the wine I've chose to kind of demonstrate this, which by accident, I was actually testing out my Coravin. I don't know if any of you had heard, have heard about the Coravin. It's like my favorite wine accessory. It's awesome. It's essentially a gadget and it puts a, a needle through the cork of, of a wine bottle and it can extract as much wine as you want to taste from that wine and you don't have to open the bottle and spoil the whole bottle. So I've been like sipping off this special bottle, but for Hurricane Irma, I forgot to put it back in the in the cellar so Steve luckily found it but I wanted to go ahead and drink it I didn't want to risk ruining it and it is drinking beautifully my friends it is da -da -da -da, the Joseph Phelps insignia it's the 2008 vintage I don't know if yeah you can see that right there it's a 2008 and insignia was one of basically the first California cult wines and it is just Oh wait, before I, I want to make sure I didn't miss a question, Laura says, no power six days, open to Peter Michael Red Blend, didn't want to chance it going bad, it was wonderful, big, bold, and luscious, exactly what you should be doing. And you know, sometimes we wait too long on these bottles anyway, so when in doubt, just drink it, drink it and enjoy it, don't wait for the special occasion. As Maya said in Sideways, the day you open the bottle is the special occasion. So that was the case with this wine. And let me tell you, it's drinking beautifully. So I don't know if anybody else, it, have any of you um, dug into some special bottles over this most recent storm, you know, after the storm? I'd, lo I'd love to know. But this is definitely, definitely a favorite. Let me make sure I didn't miss anybody. Awesome. So in any event, let, let me pour myself some. Why don't I? And if you have any questions, go ahead and questions, comments, go right ahead. But um, again, Joseph Phelps created this wine. Again, it was one of the first, um, the first cult cabs. And hold on, let me just make sure. Oh, it was California's first proprietary red Bordeaux style blend. And initially when he came out with it, 
he didn't intend for Cabernet Sauvignon to be the main grape every year, but that's kind of the way, like the first vintage it was, but then the second vintage, it was primarily Merlot. But basically every vintage since 1974 has been at least 50% Cab. So it is a Cab driven wine. And gosh, it's beautiful. The 2008 is a blend of 89% Cabernet Sauvignon, 7% Petit Verdot, and 4% Merlot, all from 100% estate-grown Napa Valley fruit. And it is a beauty, let me tell you. Let me make sure, I wanna make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and dive into our tasting for purely selfish reasons. But again, and for a 2008, so this wine is almost 10 years old, but you can see that color is still as dense and as dark and as beautiful. It's purple and garnet. There's no browning around the around the rim. After 10 years of age, it looks very youthful and very delicious. And just like a wine of this caliber and age should. Again, there's no seeing through this wine. It's made with very thick skin grapes, which make very densely colored juice, which kind of makes sense. So anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and swirl and sniff. Ugh, and again, as wines age, this is a, a wonderful example. They become not as fruity, but they, again, they develop that certain something. So it's got a very like earthy nose, a little bit of, of mushroom and blackberry and chocolate and roasted plum. And even on the nose of these wines, you can smell the complexity. It, it's really amazing how it kind of translates that way. So... I definitely want to go ahead and try it. And if I, anyway, the price of this wine, it's about $200 a bottle, but there will, not a drop of this will go to waste, I promise. So I'm going to go ahead and sip and swish. You can't drink that and not smile, sorry. And again, this is why you age wine, folks. And not everybody likes aged wine, and there's nothing wrong with that. If you like wines that are, that are very fruity, and with a, with a lot of tannin, younger wines might be for you, but wines as they age, again, they, the tannins mellow out. That's one of the primary things that happens. And they all wines also lose their fruit and become better integrated and develop, again, these con, this complexity and these characteristics that you would never taste in the wine right after release. So again, it's got a beautiful, so much more complexity on the palate. You get lovely, again, the roasted plum and the and the blackberry and the graphite and a little bit of ro like roasted coffee. And again, it's just, it's gorgeous and beautiful. It's got a beautiful mouthfeel to it as well. It just kind of coats your palate and it's just heavenly. Can you tell I like it? <laughs> yeah, winegasm, exactly, Laura. God, I love that term. And I will footnote you whenever I use it. Yeah, that is definitely a winegasm worthy wine for sure. But again, a little bit of cassis and spice from the oak and all that great stuff, as I'm sure you've you've gotten by now if I has, haven't made a big enough deal about it. But um, any questions about this wine or again, any special wines you guys might have dug, dug into after the storm? Oh wait, and Jennifer says, the Wednesday before the hurricane, my boss was giving out bottles of wine to the employees that he had purchased for a prior party. I took a bottle of Zelina Pinot Grigio. It stayed cold in my fridge when I lost power. It was delicious, uh, delicious during the days without power. Cheers, I, I love that. That's awesome, that's a good boss. That's a good boss. Call me when he's giving out wine next time. I'll pretend I'm an employee. <laughs> And let's see. Yeah, Insignia. It's a good one. And we have a few more bottles in there. So, and that's fun if you're someone who wants to experiment with, with aging wine and seeing if you like wine. Buy at least three bottles of a wine and, you know, try one after five years, one after ten, and then wait a few more years and see how you like it. It's really fun to watch these wines evolve. It's really, really neat. Oh, Tom says the price on this one, it's about $200. This one is, I think now that I forget what we, I forget what we paid for it, paid for it exactly, but some, something around there. And again, there's like the 2002 insignia was wine spectators, wine of the year. I think that one is a few hundred more than this even because it has such a historical significance and in any event. So again, when you get to these wines, vintage is a big deal. Vintage because every year is different. You never know what mother nature is going to throw at you. So it plays a big, big part. Yeah, I love the wine gals part. That's awesome. 
All right, so just to recap, for those of you who might be joining us, uh, we've tried three wines already. The first wine we, we did was the Matua Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. The second wine was the Mas de Brizade Rosé from France's Rhone Valley. And then this wine is our Joseph Phelps Insignia from the Napa Valley, of course. And again, this wine was to represent that you got to have a plan if, you've, if you're, if, again, five bottles or 500 bottles, have a plan for those wines to keep them at a good temperature because it'd be such a shame to throw that away just because, you know, you didn't plan accordingly. And it happens, but, all right, I'm going to take another sip of this. Or maybe another one. Somebody ask a question so I can drink this wine. I don't want to pour this out before our last wine. Um, in any event. So our next wine. All right. Hold on. Sorry. Do I have purple teeth yet? Okay. So our next wine. And I'm actually going to rinse out my glass. Our, our next wine demonstrates the wine you should drink when your power comes back. And can anyone guess what that is? Anyone guess? Based on if you've seen this show before and you know what I like, <laughs> the perfect wine to drink when your power is restored, as you might guess. Let's see. Oh, no, I know. It was just a drop. I, I drank most of it, and I'll be drinking more of it, uh, is champagne, of course. What took you guys so long? No, I'm kidding. It's a champagne. It's Charles Elsner. It's their Brut, but look, da, 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 da. it's a vintage champagne, which is even better, even better, my friends, in 2000. So this wine's got a little age on it as well. And again, can't think of anything better to sell. And we did dig into some champagne after our six days without power. And boy, did that feel good. I got to tell you. So, and it's nice to have something to look forward to as well when you're kind of sweating it out. You know, Hurricane Wilma was easy. I mean, it wasn't easy, but a cold front came in after Hurricane Wilma. So even though we didn't have power for two weeks, um, it was 50, 60 degrees. So it was, it was very nice out. And the thing with Irma was, as many of you know, and because many of you lived through it, was that the temperatures were just scorching, scorching hot and so hot. I mean, we even lost people at that that nursing home, which is so sad, so sad. And I think they're filing criminal charges against them, which they should. So sad. But in any event, that's why, you know what? But it's beautiful to see how your community, your neighborhood, your street kind of pulls together during times like this, you know, and everyone looks out for each other, which, you know, is always so nice to see. So, again, would love to celebrate these good things when they happen with something special and can't think of anything better than champagne. I think Roland's traumatized that I poured a, a sip of that insignia. I am too a little bit, but I didn't want to keep you guys any longer, but next you know what? Maybe I should have. <laughs> um, okay. So let's do our tasting of this wine. Champagne is, a uh, most brute champagne, most champagne you see in the stores is not vintage champagne. It's a brute non-vintage is what they call it. In all houses, it's, it's what each champagne house sells the most of. And it doesn't have a year associated with it. Every year they blend the grapes and different years together to get consistency. Champagne houses are always about consistency when it comes to their, their brute wine. But only in the best years do the houses make a vintage champagne only in the best years from their best grapes and 2000 was one of them and it was con considered to be one of the best years for champagne ever as was 2002 um and what happens to champagne as it ages is a beautiful thing a lot of people think might think you can't age champagne it's a white wine for whatever reason champagne is one of my favorite wines to drink with age on it I can't tell you, this New Year's, we had a 20-year-old um, Tattinger, their Tete de Cuvée, the Comte de Champagne. It, it literally, I will remember it for the rest of my life. It is, it evolves into kind of a more, just the complexity is outrageous. It has beautiful, it gets nuttier and toastier and just, the flavors just blow your mind. It's amazing. So, you know, if you want to sock away a bottle of, 
of a nice champagne. I highly recommend it if you're a fan because it is it is just joyful. So let's go ahead and dive into our tasting. I mean, you look at this wine. You can tell this doesn't look like a wine that you just purchased. You can see it's like a deep golden color. Again, as white wines age, they become darker. As red wines age, they get lighter. So this wine, just by looking at it, you can tell, and you notice it's not as bubbly. Over time, champagne tends to lose its bubbles, but um, but it it still has a little bit of fizz to it. Um, but the, again, this looks like, without even tasting it or smelling it, I can tell that this is definitely an, an aged white wine because it's definitely much darker than you would expect. So next would be swirl and sniff, but with bubbles. I don't like to swirl because it dissipates the bubbles. So I'm going to roll right into smelling the wine. Ugh. And I'm telling you, I, w I wish you guys could smell it. Can you smell it? <laughs> I wish you could. Sorry for the for the lip gloss. Uh, the on the nose, this is just beautiful. It's like creme brulee and hazelnut and and just like toasted brioche bread. It's just like heavenly, heavenly on the nose. And I can't wait to try it. So, yes, cheers. Yeah, and sip and swish. It definitely still has some bubbles on the palate, even though you can't see them. But, I mean, the complexity is just outrageous. It's kind of like lemon tart and hazelnut. And the finish just, like, goes on for days. Days and days and days. Like, I can still taste that, and it's just... Again, you get some spice notes, and it's just kind of like an onion, not in the flavor sense, but just there's like layers and layers that keep unfolding. I've been sipping this for, you know, probably like the past half hour just to get a good good sense of what it's like. But each time you sip it, it kind of reveals something more. And can you tell I like vintage champagne? I think I'm having another wine gasm. I'm going to have to take a nap after this. Um, but again, so we got to celebrate these good times after we go through something bad. And, and I can't wait to raise a glass to the folks in Puerto Rico. And there's so many other places in the world right now where there's just tragic things happening because of natural disasters. So I can't wait to toast them when everything is back the way it should be. And again, a special bottle like this is a great, great way to do it. Um, so are there any questions about any of our wines we've tried today? Let's see, we had our New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and our French Rosé from Mas de Brazade, our Joseph Phelps Insignia from the Napa Valley, and then this beautiful Charles Eldner Brut Champagne from the 2000 Vintage. This bottle is about $50 a bottle. Um, and I think, I don't know that you can still find it in the store, but I, anyway, I would go, if you're a champagne fan, go to your local wine retailer and just buy the most recent release of vintage champagne. There's so, I mean... There's so many good ones that they are. And Charles Elner, it's a smaller house. It was founded in 1905, and it's now run by the Charles Elner's um, grandson and his family. And that's another thing about French wine. You have these years and years of generations running the same winery, which is so beautiful. This wine, it's a blend of 65% Chardonnay and 35% Pinot. Again, all from the 2000 vintage because it has that date on it. So you have to, all the... The grapes have to be from that vintage. Um, and again, yeah, all of his wines, I'm just thinking of some details, fermented in stainless steel. There's no malolactic fermentation, which some houses do, but it keeps the wine pretty crisp and clean. But again, after a few years, it, it just gets so much more beautiful, as if it wasn't good enough to start. It's just, just fabulous. So, oh, Tom says, or asks, are there any wine events coming up in our area? Not... Not that I can say right now, but I, I might have some things to tell you. And actually, I'm going to be out of town next week, but I will be back with you the week after that. And I think I'm going to have some great... I know it's been frustrating not being able to release the wines, working on a retail partner. That's just, just going to make so much more sense to send everyone to one place than having people scramble around to try to put bottles together. So I hope when I see you, and that's that's going to be on Friday, October 13th, uh, I hope to have some fun things to announce to you and some events locally, some tastings I'm working on putting together. Um, so I'll have some fun stuff to tell you then. So um, if there aren't any more questions, let's see, I want to make sure I didn't miss anybody. I'll go ahead and let you go. And cheers to you. I hope this has helped 
you know, alleviate a little hurricane anxiety. Maybe you might be better prepared for a next storm and you got to protect that wine. You know, it's important, especially if you've, if you've spent a hundred dollars on a bottle, you gotta, you know, you don't want to throw that away. So anyway, cheers to all of you for joining me again. So appreciate you being here and I hope you have a great weekend. And if you think you have any friends who might enjoy our little show, invite them with you next time. And again, I'll be back with you on Friday, October 13th for even more wine fun, okay? And if you have any suggestions for future episodes, you know, or any wines that you particularly liked, even if you're having a wine Saturday night, come back and share it here on my Facebook page. I'd love to hear about it because you know what? When it comes to wine, it's always more fun to enjoy it with people, so absolutely stop back and see me anytime. I'll be here. Yes. And look forward to seeing you all on the 13th. Cheers to a great weekend. Thanks again for joining me.